Good morning, my brothers and sisters. It's lovely to be with you. My name is Brother Richard Aleen, and uh, I am in, right now, I'm in cold Birmingham. Um, I'm very envious of all of the warmth and the heat that you guys have all the time. It makes me very annoyed when Bronwyn um, sends me photographs of the sunshine. Um, one day, one day, maybe it would be good to meet with you in person, if not in Australia, then preferably in uh, Jerusalem. So I go to Warsaw meeting along with my wife Michaela and my children Jude and Luca and I'm very I feel very privileged to be able to share some time with you this morning and share some thoughts and ideas. So um, there was a man who at the end of the day working in the factory would take a wheelbarrow with a box in it um, and he'd wheel this out of the factory and the security guard um, would say to him hey what's in that box um, and the man would say it's just just sawdust off the off the floor and the man says why have you got sawdust um well i just use it use the sawdust for stuff padding out the the beds for my my pets and the man says okay well let, let me have a look then um so the man opens up the box and sure enough inside there's sawdust next day same things ha same thing happens end of the day in the factory the man's um got a box um in the wheelbarrow and the the security guard says, hey, what's in the box? Same thing, sawdust, can I have a look? Yes, hmm, thinks this security guard. Day after day this happens. Um, ten days in, um, the security guard says, hey, I just get get the feeling that you're um, stealing something from the factory. I tell you what, if you tell me what it is, I won't tell anybody uh, about it. And the man goes, okay, um, I'm stealing wheelbarrows. Now, the the reason for that, uh, little story is because sometimes we can't see what's right in front of us, meaning that we sometimes focus on the wrong thing. And I'm talking today really about uh, things like how do we see through God's eyes? Um, how do we value things in the way that God values them? Now, um, very quickly, um, feel free to shout out if you want to, or say to the per nudge the person next to you, "What can you see on the apart from me and my little screen? What can you see on here?" Okay, um, right, hands up. Honestly, hands up if you said a black dot. Yeah, that's what. At least some of you would have said a black dot. Okay, some of you are like really clever, or like I can see a white screen. Okay, I. I get that. But it's true, a lot of us just, we focus in on the black dot. And interestingly, if you were to look at the black dot as a percentage, I would say that is probably 0.001% maybe of the, the whole of that screen, right? And yet, we miss all of the the white that's around it. The, the abundance is of the white stuff. And the reason I'm saying that is because one of the problems and challenges that we have is that we don't see our abundance. You know that song, and we'll have a look at it in a moment. Here, here it is. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed. Do you remember this song from the old days? I think it's in the, it's in the Praise the Lord book, I think. Um, but it, it tells us, count your blessings. Name them one by one. It will surprise you what the Lord has done. Right, so what we're going to do is um, turn to the person next to you and name five blessings that you can count in your life right now. If you can't think of anything, the very fact that you've got fingers or that you've got shoes on this morning, whatever it is, but just to the person next to you, name five blessings that you can count in your life right now. Okay, okay, if everyone could come back now. Um, I hope I left you enough time to do that. If not, just have a, obviously have a think about them yourself. But um, the chorus of that song then, count your blessings and 
Count your blessings, name them, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Done. It's a beautiful song. If you get a chance to sing it today as a as a meeting, then please do. Um, but like I said, um, it was the original, uh, or the very first uh, problem or sin or temptation for man was not seeing the abundance that God gave them. Because look at the description of this garden, right, in Genesis. Um all kinds of trees growing out of the ground. They were pleasing to the eye, good for food. Do you do you wonder, have you ever thought um, about the flavours? Is it just flavours that we have today, like pear and apple? Do you think there were, do you wonder if there were flavours that we have just got no idea about? There probably were, weren't they? I, I, I don't know, like, I can't think, chicken flavoured fruit, I don't know. KFC flavoured fruit, maybe. Whatever it was. Like, there was an abundance of it. It was all, like, and if I asked you how how big the Garden of Eden was, I don't know. Some people say have said to me, a few miles square. I think it was bigger than that. I think, that, I think it was a whole region. And it could have been hundreds of miles square. Who knows, right? But there are a lot of trees. And if there are a lot of trees, there are a lot of pleasing to the eye trees and a lot of good food. Right? Like that that slide that I showed you with, the, with all of the white. And yet, in the middle, this black dot in the middle of the garden with a tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right? So here's Adam and Eve. And a uh, photograph taken at the time. Yes, uh, I know. Lego comes to the rescue again. Um, and God says to them, you are free to eat from the tree in the garden. For, sorry, from any tree in the garden. Talk about abundance. But this one tree, this one tree you're not to have. And when the woman saw that the, the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, and, and I know you know this verse, but she takes it and gives it to her husband right so this this she fixates on this thing she focuses on the lack right they're surrounded by all these trees yet they focus on the lack now the sad thing in my mind was that god was going to provide these things for them anyway um, and if you co go to Psalm 19, we're not going to do it now, but if you go to Psalm 19, you'll spot the things that God was going to give them. He says the, the law, um, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And, and he goes on to say, look at verses 7 to 10. I'm not going to do it now, but he says it's like sweeter than honey. It says makes wise the simple. And it says gives light to the eyes. The law of the Lord, following my ways, following the ways that... Um, I want you to uh, to live. That That's how I'm going to provide for you. All these things that you desired, God was going to give it to them anyway. And so the problem for us is that we have the same thing that Adam and Eve had, the focus on the lack. Because I tell you what, we have so much abundance. Like We live like kings and queens in this day and age, comparatively. I mean... Um, how long have antibiotics been around? Um, it's only in the past, I don't even know, it's le less than a hundred years, isn't it? Um, you think the abundance of wealth that we have compared to our grandparents even, or our great-grandparents, great and you just have to go back a few generations. We live like kings and queens, relatively. Look at, we've got more money than any generation before. We've got, we've got AI, we've, we, we're, we understand health in a better way. We've got so many clothes. If I have a, a hole in a pair of my jeans or something, I'll chuck it away. You know, it's a dispo we're a disposable generation. And, and, and yet what we do is that we look at what others have, and that makes me look at what I don't have, and I struggle to be content. Maybe maybe you've got this sorted, but I suspect if you're anything like me, 
that we're often looking at what other people have and thinking, why don't I have that? Striving after these things. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy, your reward in heaven, nor your home on high. So, fixing our eyes then on what's truly important, what's truly valuable, Hebrews tells us, doesn't it, to fix our eyes on Jesus. Stop looking at your lack. Stop looking at what you don't have. Think about what you have in Christ Jesus. Um, you can turn to Luke 18 if you want to, but the verses are there on the screen. A certain ruler says to Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus says. No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments, and he lists off these commandments. Well, all of these I've kept since I was a boy. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Now, let's go back to that image that I put up of the white screen with the black dot in the middle. Because when we, when you look at that image that I put up, white screen, abundance, black dot in the middle. Um, when we initially spoke about that, we're really talking about kind of physical things, aren't we? And when I asked you to think about all the things, all the blessings you have, maybe you talked about your house, I, I don't know, maybe you talked about you having a job, all these physical things, right? We have money, we have houses, we have a whole heck of a lot of stuff. What Jesus is doing here is flipping it round. And instead of having a white background with a black dot, we're now looking at it differently. We've got a black background and we've got a white dot. And Jesus is saying, you've got all this stuff. Remember it says that he was a rich rich man. He's he's uh, got probably got status as a... Um, for religious people that know him, he's probably got status, he's got wealth, he's kept the law since he was a child, he's probably had a great family, you've taught him stuff. He's got loads of stuff. And yet Jesus says, you lack one thing. It's the white dot on this picture. And what is it that he's lacking? Well, there's something about not focusing on the earthly things, but setting your minds on things above. What did he lack? Um, and, and maybe you've got your ideas of what that is. And there's probably lots of correct ideas, but I'm going to present one to you. And it's from Psalm 23, because this, where Jesus says, you lack one thing. I think Jesus is lifting that from Psalm 23. You see, in Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack one thing. It's the same phrase. And Jesus is saying, If you have the Lord as your shepherd, then what are you going to do? What's he going to guide you to do? Like, forget your abundance of wealth and stuff. In fact, sell it all and give it to the poor and come and follow me. Then you won't be in lack anymore. Now that we're on Psalm 23, I'm going to take you down a little tangent because I think this is a lovely point, something that I, I've heard fairly recently and I just love it. Can you see what it says there? He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. Just a quick link there um, uh, in terms of the provision of the shepherd. I don't want to jump too far away but we were looking at this in Bible class last night I think, was it last night? And how when you come to the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark's Gospel you have 
um, uh, it specifically says that he asks them to sit down and green grass in Mark's Gospel. And then, do you know what happens after the feeding of the 5,000? The next thing is that you have Jesus walking on the water and the waves all, uh, and the wind all ceases and the water goes still um, and becomes quiet. It's just a lovely sort of image of, of Jesus as the shepherd. In fact, he talks about sheep, doesn't he, in uh, Mark's Gospel. Anyway, um, I'm going off, off topic there. Um, but look at what it does. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, when you think about green pastures... What do you think of, um, I don't know what Australia is like, where you are, what your greenness is like, but when I think about it, I think about this. This is Wales, right? Wales and England rains all the time, hence there's tons of green grass. And so we think to ourselves, when we read green pastures, our, our, West, our sort of Western brains think, oh yes, we're talking about lovely long grass. And there we are, two little sheep up there, um, nice and at rest. But if you lived at the time of Jesus... That wasn't green pastures, because what actually happened was you didn't want flocks grazing in the actual farmlands, because you didn't want sheep eating the, the the crops. So sheep were actually kept somewhere else. And this is green pastures in the desert, and it's called green pastures because if you look carefully, can you see there's little tufts? I don't know how big this screen is, but you can see across the top there, um, what can I do a laser pointer, I can't, no, across the top there there's um, a whole load of sheep and those sheep are in the middle of a desert but there are tufts, can you see them, the little tufts of green here and there now why are there tufts of green? it's because um, the warm breeze carries the carries water in the air from the sea and at night um, it condenses on the underside of rocks and it's just enough water to create little bits of green where little bits of plant can grow even in the desert and so as a shepherd takes their sheep across these, the green pastures, the sheep have enough just for that bite. Right? The shepherd gives the sheep or leads the sheep to have enough food just for that moment. Now, we don't know what's going to happen around the corner. We don't know where the shepherd's going to what's going to happen over the brow of the hill, how much grass there's going to be or isn't. But we trust the shepherd that he gives us just enough for now. Let tomorrow take care of itself. This is what green pastures means. He leads me and he gives me enough for today. Give us this day our daily bread. Um, okay. How valuable is it? So we're going to think a bit more about value now. So um, just shout out some answers. I know I'm a video, but shout out anyway. This is a tea bag. Guess how much this is worth? Can you see? Can you see what it is? So if you look very carefully, it's a tea bag. It's got diamonds all over it. This is fourteen thousand um, dollars, American dollars. Um, any ideas what this is? Can you see that? This is a diamond encrusted contact lens. If I need contacts, I think I would wear one of these, I reckon. But this is 15,000 US dollars. Pretty obvious what this is. A golden block of Lego worth 14, that $14,500 dollars. Um, this, this is not just a, this is not a fo um, uh, AI image. This actually exists. This gold leaf toilet paper um, is valued at 1.38 million US dollars. <laughs> um, it's crazy, isn't it? Crazy, the value of these things. Right, your turn, right? Uh, please, shout out. What do you think? This brush water bowl. That's all I'm giving you. It's all the detail you're, you're having. Any ideas um, how much this might be worth? It's only about this big, I think. Only about that big calling out some ideas? Bronwyn, are they calling out? Okay, um, this was sold for, who got the closest? 37.68 million. This is a Roy Gyanyao brush water bowl, washable. <laughs> okay, um, another one. Um, this clay pot. Any ideas? Any ideas, Bronwyn? Any ideas? 
Okay, this was uh, off Amazon, £15.99. Um, uh, did I get you with that one? Uh, what about this Rolex watch? Oh, I hear some of you thinking, is it real? Is it fake? This is a fake 25 quid um, pocket watch. Um, any ideas for this one? Uh, oh, if you look closely, look, it says Patek Philippe. $24 million. Um, but this bracelet I've got a bit of a story with. Um, so this, so it was my wife's, um, uh, you'd need, okay, context, right? So it was my wife's 40th birthday. Now she lost her mom a few years ago. And um, uh, so it was my, my wife's uh, 40th birthday and we had a 75 people around at the house, all squeezed in, it was raining outside, so everybody was squished in. Um, and basically after the party, um, we're clearing up, and in our pl we've got a playroom where the kids um, mess around and so on. And in the playroom, the kids had found this, this bracelet, and they were sort of chucking it around, and um, they had, like one of them had it in his mouth, pretending it was his teeth. Um, and I was like, Jude, give me that. Um, let me see what it is. I've had a look at it. Didn't know. Didn't recognise it. Michaela didn't recognise it. So we put a message on the WhatsApp group. Somebody messaged back saying, "Richard, you need to take that down straight away." And I was like, "Message me privately. Why? Why do I need to take this down?" She was like, do, "Don't you know what that is?" I was like, "No idea what it is." She's like, "That is a Cartier love bracelet." I was like, "Cartier love bracelet." Started googling it, looking it up. Okay, it's worth five and a half thousand pounds. My kids were flinging this thing around, right? And um, suddenly, I just want you to note this. So, so basically, the the story is that this was my wife's mum's bracelet, and I think one of the kids had found it. Michaela had inherited a bunch of her jewellery and stuff. One, the, somebody had found it and was. I don't know how it got downstairs, but it did. Anyway, the point is, we didn't recognise it what it was, and we were. I didn't care what it was. As soon as I realised the value of it, can you imagine how suddenly I change? What I do now. Now I'm like, oh my goodness, give me that careful, wrapping it up, making sure it's clean, making sure there's no fingerprints on it. And now this thing that was being flung around the room a few moments ago is now the most important thing. <laughs> I'm like, give me that. We're going to keep that safe. Can you see the difference when you realise the value of something? When you, when you think it's cheap, when you think it's free, you don't care much for it. But when you realise it's worth, you treat it differently. <laughs> okay, one more thing. Tell me the price of this. Tell me the value of this. See, if we truly realised the value of the blood of Christ that sacrifice. If, if we really believed and understood that the Son of God, the creator of the universe, the Son of the creator of the universe, bled and died so that we could have life and be saved from our sin. And sin is killing us and we've been saved by it because of this blood. If we truly grasp the value of this, Maybe it's going to change what we do with it. Maybe it will change how we behave. Maybe maybe it's not take it or leave it anymore, as seems to be the approach to Jesus. Maybe it's like, my word, I owe my life to this. And I'm going to live like this now. There's a, a lovely um, hymn, um, just some lyrics from it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So we're thinking about now talking um, about how to look at things differently. Right? When you see Jesus, everything else dims, stra becomes strangely dim in comparison to how wonderful he is. That, 
that blood that I've just talked about. And, and I want to use Paul as an example um, uh, on, on someone who actually does this. I want to see how it, what it looks like when it's put into practice. So this is Paul in Philippi, and he says, he says, rejoice in the, the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, if, if I was going to write a letter to, to believers saying rejoice and have, I hope you're happy, um, I might be in a, I don't know, in the Bahamas maybe, um, in a hammock having a pina colada. But not Paul. Paul is in prison and he is death row, on death row, and he's chained up. And there's something about his situation which doesn't make sense. Right, and yet he thanks God for it, and yet he talks about rejoicing when he's in the the depths of a dungeon, chained up to a wall under twenty four hour guard, lock and key. And how is it that you do that? How can you talk about rejoicing, Paul? Well, it's because he's doing something called reframing. So he is looking at things through God's eyes. So what what do I mean by this? Well, Paul could have said said I want you to know brothers and sisters what happened to me is really terrible as a result of all this awful stuff uh, that I've been through I'm quitting church I'm never going to go back again it's way too stressful following God I mean look at where I am that's what he could have said but he doesn't he says I want you to know brothers that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel he has a captive audience it means that because there's a Roman guard um, chained to him every day he's preaching the gospel to this these Roman gods these Roman gods by the way he would have been hitting him and brutalizing him and hurting him but eventually he is just preaching this gospel and as a result he says it's become clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in these chains for Christ so Paul's basically saying that these chains, which felt like they were holding me back, or look like they're holding me back, are actually serving to advance the gospel. Verse 14, because of my chains, my brothers and sisters have become more confident as well. So he's saying these, this terrible situation I find myself in has become the reason and the means by which the gospel is preached. Not just by me, but my brothers and sisters have had the confidence to preach it to. Now that is a different way of looking at your situation. And we can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. Rejoice in the Lord, he says, in this terrible situation. Don't be anxious in anything. Reframe the chains. Now, what I want you to do is get your piece of paper. Right, where's my piece of paper? Hang on. Um... I hope you've all got your pieces of paper. Um, so here you go. You might have... Um, here you go, let me just cut mine in half. Uh, so you've got an A... Hopefully you've got an A5 size piece of paper like that. Okay, can you see that? So what we're going to do is fold that in half. And then what we're going to do is sort of cut down or tear down on the inside. So along... So where it opens up along this edge, tear down, a, tear out a square, okay, that's what we're going to do, does everyone do that, there you go, and if you've done that, you should hopefully have a frame, can you see me, now, this is your reframing, okay, so what we're going to do, um, we're going to have a go at looking at a situation differently. So you got your frame. This is God's way of looking at things. Okay. So wh when you look at through this, this is God's way of looking at something. Um, so, um, ooh, let me just skip forward um, and get to my picture. Here we go. Right, so here's our eyes. This is how we see this situation. So if you looked at that picture, what would you say the day is going to be like? pretty rubbish if it's going to rain it's probably going to be thundery isn't it this is not a good day ahead of us um, that's how I see it now after three I want you to put up your 
Uh, don't do it yet. I'm going to count to three, and when I say three, I'm going to go one, two, three. You put your things up, and I'm going to show you how God looks at it. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> so are you all looking at that day? Right. Um, unfortunately, my head's in the way, but can you see where I am here? This, this is the, that is a close-up there of this this bit down here where I am. But if you look, I've zoomed in on this little bit where my head is now. But from God's perspective, he can see all, I can't point the right way, all of that sunshine to come. That's what God can see. And if we could look with God's eyes, and it's hard to do. Of course it's hard to do. And yet what Paul does is say, actually, I trust that God's got a plan and purpose for me, even in this jail. Okay, I'm going to bring my thoughts to an end. I don't know how long I've been talking for, and I really apologise, because I do waffle on, but um, I just want to finish with this, because we've talked about valuing things, we've talked about how much do you value the, the blood of Christ, I've talked about how we um, always look at the lack and the stuff that we don't have and, and what I'm trying to get us to do is think to ourselves, do you know, we have so much in him. We have so much. so And it's priceless. You know, forget that pocket watch for 24 million or whatever it was. We're talking a value way beyond that. And to do it, I just want to finish off with this brief story. Um, all about the pearl. Now, I've got a pearl here. Um, now, I can't. I don't think you've got your pearls, have you? But um, mm, I'm by the t at the point of recording this. I haven't asked Bronwyn to get you pearls, but if she has, then that would be really great. But if she hasn't, um, that's okay too. But I've got mine. If you've got yours, then that's lovely. If you don't, then don't worry. Um, but here's my pearl. Now the kingdom of heaven... Oh, I've switched sides, haven't I? Sorry. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he finds one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So, very quickly, um, what do you think the... Who do, you, who do you think the man is and what do you think the pearl represents? So any ideas? Just shout them out or say them to the person next to you. Who's the man? What is the pearl and what does it mean that he went and sold everything he had and bought it? Okay, are you done? Okay, come back. Okay, good. Now, most people that I ask this question to will say, I think the pearl is the kingdom of God or the gospel, or the good news. The man is me, and I found it. And the challenge is, am I willing to give up everything to get this? Because that's, that's a bit like the rich young man, wasn't it? Like Jesus says to him, well, you know, um, come and follow me, have the pearl, but give up everything you've got. Sell all, sell all you have and give to the poor, and then come follow me. And I get that, and that's there's probably a very big element of that in this story. But I just want to ask you just to briefly look at it in a slightly different way. Because this this parable is from Matthew 13. And it's interesting because when you look at Matthew 13 and all the different parables, his, I think that's all of them, but if you look at all the different parables, so are the weeds, the mustard seed, they're all stories that have got a, a man in them. Well, apart from the yeast, that's got a woman in, in it. Um, and, and if I said, who's the man, the sower, well, that's God for sure, it, like Jesus tells us. The weeds, well that's the son of man, because the parable tells us. The mustard seed, hmm, could be, it's probably God, because it's about um, uh, having um, faith like a mustard seed, it sort of tell, and it's planted in a in a man's field. Is that right? Can't, forgetting now, but anyway, check that one out. The man is God. The yeast, the woman, is the, is probably God as well. The fisherman, well we know that's God, or the son of man, or whoever's whoever's doing the judgment at the end of the age, um, separating the good, good and the bad fish. So it's all of them, in every case, it's God or the son of man. 
So when we come to this one about the pearl, can I just ask you to look at it in a slightly different way? Because if the man is God, the merchant is God, and he's looking for fine pearls, and he finds one of great value, what was he looking for? And who does he find? And I think the answer comes from Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16, you say? Yes, Ezekiel 16. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut. It's talking about Israel, isn't it? Nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt and water. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into an open field. For on the day you were born, you were despised. Right? Israel, dying in a field. A bit like this parable, right? Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood. You were dying, and I made you... And I said to you, live, and I made you grow like a plant of the field. Very similar to some of the parables in Matthew 13. And thou hast increased and waxen great, says in the King James Version. In Greek, uh, sorry, in Hebrew the word is ad, And the word means you have become jewelly or pearly or like a pearl. The word for jewel and pearl are the same in Hebrew. So you've become like a pearl. And then look at what he says. I bathed you with water. I clothed you. I put fine linen, costly garments. Verse 11. I adorned you with jewellery, bracelets on you, ring in your nose. Um, adorned with gold and silver. Your food was like this. You became a beautiful rose. Your beauty was perfect. So God finds this baby in the field, Israel. And he sees her like this pearl. Now sadly, of course, she becomes a prostitute. But if the man who finds the pearl is God, then perhaps we are the pearl. Then perhaps the man would give everything, even his only begotten son, to have you give up everything to have you and this idea of us being the pearl is no surprise those who feared the Lord talked with each other and the Lord listened and heard and he said in verse 17 they will be my treasure my treasured possession there are other verses you probably can think of too but can I put it to you that God sees you as a pearl of great price that he wants more than anything. You see, we've been talking about how we value God and the blood of Christ. But to finish off, I want you to just think about how much God values you. Even you, even me, broken, sinners, sinful, letdowns, all of those things. And yet, he loves us. So, brothers and sisters, do we value the blood of Christ as you take this bread and wine? Do you value it? What does it mean to you? What is it worth to you? Because if it's worth an incalculable amount, if you realise it saved your life, what's going to change about the way that you live? If you realise how much God loves you, that he would give his only begotten son for you, what's going to change about the way that you address him, speak with him, obey him, follow him? What are you going to do differently? And maybe that's something you could think about as we share this bread and wine together. I'm sorry that I've gone on for so long, but I hope it's been... Um, helpful. Amen.